So maybe we start. Good morning, everybody, at this early time of the day. Thank you very much for coming so early for this um, very interesting session uh, where we will uh, report on uh, late breaking uh, news and um, from ongoing clinical trials. That's the first session of two of them. We have again uh, presentations of uh, 12 minutes each with three minutes of discussion. And we will dis start with uh, Dr. Neil Desai, who will give uh, actually two presentations this morning in two different functions, as I noticed. Um, he will start uh, with an update on uh, new clinical studies, studies using the uh, well-known uh, drug Abraxane. And he will report this as a vice president, strategy platforms at Celgene General Corporation in Los Angeles. So please, Neil, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I see it's very crowded this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, most people are probably at breakfast, but uh, I'll try and keep it short and sweet. Um, let's see if I can get, okay. So, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, new clinical studies with Abraxane. It's amazing, you know, after 10 years of Abraxane approval that uh, we continue to do, explore uh, new things and new indications and new combinations. And as you know about immunotherapy, you heard uh, in the last few days uh, some of the benefits and dramatic responses in immunotherapy. There's some very valid reasons to combine those drugs with uh, Abraxane, and that's what I'll show you today. So uh, I, I don't think I need to introduce this, but um, uh, it just shows you a picture of what Abraxane looks like. And our understanding of this has been evolving over the years. Um, just by way of uh, summary, again, it's approved. It was first approved for breast cancer, and then subsequently in lung cancer, and uh, more recently in pancreatic cancer. And then, as of 2015, the sales were just under a billion dollars. So we hope to cross the billion uh, this year. <coughs> Now, uh, four different tumor types, which I mentioned, uh, the approvals, and these were based on comparative trials with uh, paclitaxel or taxol, which you're familiar with. So in breast cancer, it was a head-to-head -head comparison where we had a response rate endpoint. In non-small cell lung cancer, it was a combination with carboplatin, again, head-to-head -head with uh, 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 standard paclitaxel with cremaphore. And there we also uh, got approval based on a response rate endpoint. In pancreatic cancer, of course, it was with gem, uh, comparison against gemcitabine, uh, which is a standard of care. And so now the Abraxane gemcitabine combination is the standard of care in pancreatic cancer almost worldwide. Uh, and there we were show, for the first time, we were able to show an improvement in survival. Uh, in pancreatic cancer patients. And then uh, we had a large trial in melanoma as well, which was a single agent, Abraxane versus um, Decarbazine, which was the st previous standard in melanoma, and we could show an improvement in progression-free survival. So uh, as far as the mechanism, again, we've talked about this before, so I just want to briefly show you that once the particles are injected into the bloodstream, then over time they, they come apart, and uh, that's the idea, to break down into albumin-bound complexes of uh, paclitaxel, as well as intact nanoparticles. And all of these species can then ultimately transport across the endothelium of the blood, uh, of the blood vessel into the tumor. And by uh, a couple of different processes, we have an active transport process, which is caviolar transport, so which is triggered by albumin that takes the particles and the complexes across into the tumor space. And then if there's leaky junctions, then we get through that as well. So uh, now to, to uh, talk about immunotherapy. You heard a lot about immunotherapy in the last years and, in fact, at this meeting. Uh, in particularly in hematological cancers, Immunotherapy works very well, especially single-agent uh, antibodies against the checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 or PD-L1. <clears throat> but in the solid tumor field, uh, there's been limited efficacy as single agents. So the question is why? Uh, it's probably due to penetration of the tumor or the microenvironment is very different. Uh, but this you know, sort of brings the opportunity to see what we can do to improve the outcomes in combination with these um, uh, immunotherapies. So um, 
just to show you some data in solid tumors with single agent immunotherapy. So nivolumab, which is a anti-PD-1 antibody in squamous cell, non-squamous lung cancer, the overall response rate is 19 percent. So it's not dramatic. Uh, pembrolizumab, uh, which is another anti-PD-1, or atezolizumab, uh, which is anti-PD-L1, in uh, uh, triple negative breast cancer, um, response rate is about 19 percent. Uh, ipilipumab and um, anti-PDL1 in pancreatic cancer, there's no responses. Uh, nivolumab in phase three renal cell carcinoma, uh, where it got approved, based on a response rate of 25 percent. And then in advanced bladder cancer, also there's an approval um, response rate. 24.4 percent. So uh, these are r good responses, but they are, and they're uh, durable responses. But um, there's clearly a need to improve on these outcomes, especially in solid tumors. So uh, the question is, what's the rationale of combination? So there's been some evidence that it, when you use cytotoxic therapy, for example, uh, abraxane, that the lysing of the tumor cell, when you get the tumor cell kill, uh, itself creates an endogenous um, cancer vaccine by exposing a lot of the tumor cell antigens. And then when you, if you come in with immunotherapy, then maybe you've uh, uh, helped, uh, you know, create that uh, environment where the immunotherapy can work better. Uh, it's known to activate dendritic cells. Uh, we can deplete immunosuppressive Tregs, which are often responsible for um, the immunosuppression within the tumors. And then it also increases the TILs, or the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this has also been shown in the clinic. So for example, this graph here is uh, in a, a triple negative breast cancer population, which received uh, neoadjuvant cytotoxic therapy and then measuring before and after the number of TILs in the tumors, uh, you could see the increase. And also, the increase in the TILs was associated with better survival. So uh, as far as preclinical evidence supporting the case of combination, uh, there's some nice data that's been presented. Uh, if you look at this uh, tumor curve uh, here, uh, this was in combination with uh, the anti pdl one uh, antibody atezolizumab. Uh, in this case, you have the control, which is in blue, um, and um, you have uh, napaclitaxel or abraxane. And can you see my pointer? No. Okay. Um, uh, which is given at a very low dose. So there's marginal effect, if any, on the tumor that you can see, but it, it, it's... Uh, so, so the question is, can you improve this? And with the anti pdl one you see itself that you get uh, some effect. But when you use the combination, uh, the effect is pretty dramatic. And we don't exactly know the mechanism, but the proposed mechanism could be this aspect of, uh, you know, uh, inducing more antigen from the, from the tumor. And if you look at the, <clears throat> the, the CD8-positive tumor cells, that in the control versus any cytotoxic uh, treated, whether it's with a taxane or a platinum, the, the number of CD8 um, uh, positive cells go up at uh, day 10 after treatment. So that's also an indication that uh, the cytotoxic therapy can, in fact, uh, help uh, to, to increase the efficacy with uh, antibodies. Uh, this is in the clinic now, uh, looking at uh, uh, patients who have received uh, uh, nampaclitaxel. And, and you can see here, again, that uh, by uh, a cycle two, day one, which is, uh, uh, which is about, um, I would say, four weeks or five weeks in to treatment, you can see the expansion of the CD8 uh, positive T cells. So uh, now to the clinical studies. Uh, there's early evidence in the uh, combination in uh, non-small cell lung cancer and breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. And so if you see this study, this was a uh, fairly complex study where uh, the antibody, anti pdl one was combined with a number of different cytotoxic regimens. And for sake of um, time, I'm just showing you a comparison of two relevant ones. The, uh, on the left is the one with Taxol, a combination, uh, and on the right is the one with the Braxane. So each of these is the, the tumor response 
here in terms of shrinkage. Uh, and then uh, what we see, which is interesting, is that you get about a 50% response rate with conventional paclitaxel, so cremophore-based paclitaxel, and you get a 56% response rate with uh, a Braxane here in combination, but you see four complete responses and uh, five partial responses, whereas here you see only uh, partial responses. So the question is, again, we don't fully understand the mechanism, but clearly there's something going on. I mean, granted, these are small populations, but to see four complete responses uh, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, out of nine patients uh, that got responses is, uh, is quite dramatic. Uh, there's a, a phase one study of nivolumab, uh, which is the anti-PD-1 now, uh, in, again, in a non-small cell lung cancer. And again, um, you see that there, there was a, a, a response in these patients. Uh, you can see the tumor shrinkage in 83% uh, of the patients. And um, in this trial, again, these are small numbers of patients. <clears throat> there were six PRs. Uh, partial responses, uh, and uh, the overall response rate was about 66 or 67 percent. So these numbers, if you remember the numbers I showed you with the single agents, are quite dramatically higher than uh, the, the antibodies alone. So based on that, there's uh, been a flurry of new trials that have uh, been started. And in fact, uh, some large phase three trials have, uh, have been initiated. So in combination with uh, tezolizumab, there's uh, two phase three trials, uh, one in first line squamous non-small non cell lung cancer and then non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, so these are uh, trials of 1,200 and uh, in almost 600 patients. Uh, and there's other uh, areas where there's combinations going on in either phase one or two settings uh, with the other antibodies. And there's a number of investigator-sponsored studies also going in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, quickly in breast cancer, this is metastatic uh, triple negative breast cancer, which is a difficult disease. So uh, here we have a combination that's been tested and we have a 42% uh, response rate. So <clears throat> the, the initial data looks uh, fairly promising. And based on this, uh, there's several breast cancer trials that are ongoing with combinations of uh, these antibodies. Uh, then pancreatic cancer, that's always a tough uh, beast to try and uh, uh, tame. But uh, since abraxane gemcitabine is now the standard of care, uh, for pancreatic cancer, there's several trials now that are com combining different agents and different uh, immuno-oncology agents with uh, the Braxane gemcitabine. And here are just a couple. Uh, there's demcizumab, which is another antibody. There's uh, indoximod, which is these are the, uh, the uh, IDO inhibitors, which have also shown a good promise in, um, uh, in sort of the immuno-oncology space. Uh, by working on some of the pathways related to uh, the T cells, and then combination with nivolumab. So, uh, and here's the trials that are now ongoing in pancreatic cancer. So there's a lot of investigation with a number of different agents, all of them using Abra Abraxane gemcitabine as the stem of the therapy and then combining new agents. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Abraxane can induce uh, tumor lysis, which release, uh, results in the release of tumor antigens that can help prime the immune system for the checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, in contrast, if you see with Taxol, and we didn't have time to get into this, uh, the Taxol-based regimens are not preferred uh, in combination because they also have steroids, which are immunosuppressive. So that doesn't help the situation when you combine with immuno-oncology um, uh, drugs. And then uh, the, the single checkpoint inhibitors have low response, and so we need to help them with uh, combinations, and that's what we've done. Uh, <clears throat> there's good tolerability and safety data now in preliminary trials, and there's many uh, ongoing new trials with uh, combining different antibodies. So I'll stop there. and. Happy to take some questions.
So uh, thank you very much, Neil, for this uh, update on the ongoing success story of Aproxane. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, thank you, Neil. I just have a quick question. Um, is the um, order um, of administration important for these results? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, sequencing is uh, maybe of importance, but I'm not so very sure because these antibodies have a long half-life. So, you know, if you come in first with a Braxane, maybe there's some priming, uh, you know, based on the theory at least. Uh, but then once you have the antibody on board, you know, it stays on for, you know, several weeks. So I don't know how important... Um, the the timing and sequences ultimately sort of it's all in the uh, noise I guess but uh, we don't have concrete data on that yet. We have time for one more question. Can you speak to the microphone, please? Try another one. No. Okay, I'll, I'll try and repeat your yeah, question. Sure, yeah. speak up loud. Right, uh, kill proliferate. Oh, now it's working. Yeah. So the cytotoxic drugs kill proliferating cells. So uh, they would do not discriminate between proliferating T cells and proliferating tumor cells. And even despite of that, you see in you know uh, in expansion of the population of the CD8 plus T cells. Um, which do you do you have any explanation for the underlying mechanism? Why abroxane does not eliminate this uh, proliferating T cells? And uh, the second part of the question: uh, Did you consider uh, combining this treatment with vascular permeabilizing uh, agent? So, the, okay, so I don't know that I have the answers to that because we, um, I can't say we fully understand the mechanism. Um, so I, I think it just needs more work. But the, th there's some other aspects too that also happen uh, in response to a tumor kill, uh, right? For example, you'll see VEGF secretion levels go up and all kinds of things happen when you're actually having cytotoxic effect on the tumor cells. So maybe it's you know tied into some of those mechanisms, which are sort of response mechanisms uh, um, or defense mechanisms from the tumor that somehow result in in uh, these other effects. But if you're releasing antigens from a tumor cell, so maybe it's the body's own immune system that's kicking in to to drive up the T cell count. But I don't know, and uh, we haven't tried. Uh, with vascular permeab permeabilizing agents uh, combination. Okay, I think we have to go to the next speaker. Thanks again, Neil. Okay, thank you.